Today is April 29, 2019. I'm at the OSU Library with Dr. Earl Mitchell, who has previously participated in an oral history interview with um, Dr. Jerry Gill. That was in 2009, and that interview focused on your time as a professor here at OSU. Yes. And uh, that is in the O State Stories Oral History Collection. Today, this interview is going into the Spotlighting Oklahoma Collection, and we will focus on your time uh, with and experiences with the American Civil Liberties Union of Oklahoma. And I thank you for coming in today for this interview. It's my pleasure. Thank you for asking. Okay, so the Oklahoma affiliate was established in 1964 and opened the first headquarters in 1973. You came to OSU in 1967? 19, January 1, 1967. Okay. Roll into Stillwater, Sunday afternoon, four o'clock. I remember it very clearly. <laughs> and you came uh, in a postdoctoral research associate position, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Came to stay two years and do research in biochemistry. Okay. Did you have any prior involvement with the ACLU prior to coming to OSU? No, I had I had none. I had membership uh, when I was in graduate school, but uh, no involvement in terms of, of actually participating, but support the organization. Okay. So you said you were a member in graduate school at which university? Oklahoma, I'm sorry, Michigan State University. Okay. I, I just was a member of the ACLU uh, membership, that's all. Okay, so there was a student organization. No, a uh, national organization. Oh, you were a member of the national Just member, yeah, just, just paid dues, that's all. Okay, all right. Because it's very closely aligned with my involvement in civil rights activities and, and civil liberties. Are all, I have, those are connected in terms of I'm concerned. They are different, but yet they are connected. Okay, so um, you joined as a member because you supported the organizations. Yes, and the principles of, uh, of civil liberties for individuals, individual rights primarily. Um, when you when you moved to Stillwater, uh, were you aware that there was a Stillwater chapter of the ACLU? Well, there was there was not one here. But we I was part of the organization forming one when we first formed it in in, the, in Stillwater. So we had a chapter formed here. So I was part of the organization of forming the chapter here. Okay, tell me a little bit about that. Well, it was during a time when there was much unrest, civil liberties unrest around the country, Vietnam War, protesters, et cetera, and a number of issues at the university in terms of speakers. And so a group were interested in uh, forming some form of organization here to be a support group for, uh, we at that time, First Amendment rights, primarily First Amendment. And so ACLU, which was the organization that uh, looks at the First Amendment rights of all people, uh, was a good organization to form in Oklahoma. And I think Richard Cummins was pretty much the one of the organizers of the, of the unit at the time. He was an engineering professor of engineering, but he was very much involved in an in organization. Several of us were part of that organization mm -hmm. because I served as an officer within the uh, local organization. At one time, I was the president and also on the state board uh, in which a, a, a very close friend, uh, Gloria Valencia Labor, was the, was the chair at the time. And I think I was vice chair at the, uh, in the early 70s. Okay. Um, you mentioned uh, Richard Cummings was one of the leaders and in, instrumental in the Stillwater chapter. Yes. Um, were there other people that come to your mind who were leaders in that group? Uh, boy, not all, all fan. I know Gloria Weber, Bob Weber, uh, Richard Cummings. Uh, we had a number of students, I think, uh, uh, Louis Bullock, a uh, student at the time, was involved. And we had a lot of support from, from many faculty members uh, who were supporters of it. Uh, the names escape me right now. Okay. At some point, I can give you the names later. Were there any particular activities that the Stillwater chapter uh, was involved in? Yeah, yes, I think the, the first activity was the uh, freedom of uh, speech for the students and organization. And uh, also, we were involved when, uh, we also had a very active uh, time when Richard Nixon came to visit. Uh, we were open for making sure that there were proper, people had proper rights to just demonstrate, uh, peaceful demonstration. So we were monitors for the organization, make sure that uh, there was, that people were treated fairly, they could protest and follow the rules of protesting, but not have any 
kind of uh, activities that would pre prevent them from protesting. So we were involved in, in uh, because when Nixon came, there was still quite a bit of a uh, concern about, uh, about him as president, uh, his involvement, uh, the war, and, and all things involved with civil liberties at the time. Uh, John Mitchell was the, the, the uh, attorney general, and he had a very strong uh, sense of uh, clamp down on demonstrations and formed various different groups to stop those activities. So we were involved in trying to educate the public on individual rights and civil liberties, the right to protest First Amendment rights. And especially for those uh, young students or young people who were opposed to the war, uh, that was one of the things we were supporting very strongly, their free freedom of speech. What mechanisms uh, did the chapter use uh, in order to try to uh, communicate uh, how peaceful demonstrations would look or work uh, with a significant event like that? Yeah, we, we had workshops uh, in which we had people come and we explained to them that uh, there are certain procedures to follow when you're doing peaceful demonstration. For example, carry nothing on you that can be said to be a weapon, even if it was a pen knife. Uh, Follow the, follow the rules in terms of uh, making sure if you're a certain place you're supposed to walk, you stay in that place. You don't trespass and uh, you can be vocal, uh, but not aggressive in terms of any kind of uh, violence or physical violence, but how to do nonviolent protest. So we did have workshops on that. that and we also identified uh, those who were involved. We wore armbands as, so you know these are the ones who were uh, monitoring and watching. So we wore armbands so we'd know that uh, we could be identified. Do you remember what year that was? Uh, 72 or 73, I can't remember, the year Nixon came to. Okay, so it was after the uh, violent protests at Kent State? Oh yes, after, after that, yes, campuses. which was late 60s. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. I think 1970 was that year. Mm -hmm. So it was about 71, 72 in that period of time, yes. Okay. Were, um, was the OSU administration um, con concerned about, about this? Uh, I never had any direct uh, concern. I did, ha did have one concern when I was involved in the lawsuit. Uh, I can tell you about that. Yeah, we'll, get, yeah, we'll get to that. Tell you about that later. <laughs> but I think at the time, the administration was, was not really uh, interested in, in, in showing any kind of favoritism because they had already been uh, uh, brought to court in terms of student. And so most of the people in the administration want to stay clear of it because there's nothing like having a federal judge call you up and tell you, explain why you did this. And I think most administrators didn't want to have that on their, on their record, have an answer to a federal judge. Mm -hmm. So, you, your involvement in Oklahoma started with the Stillwater chapter? Stillwater chapter, and then yes. And then your involvement became at the state level? Yes, we had a state, state organization. And uh, we formed the state organization. I think Richard Cummings was the first chair, then Gloria Valencia became chair, and I became vice chair. And I distinctly remember that was about 1970 because that was the time when we had the prison riot at McAllister. And we were very much involved in, in, the, in the prison riot. Uh, because ACLU uh, had taken on some of the uh, reforms uh, through the, I think the Bobby Battle case, which was a form for prison reform, segregation of prisoners, ACLU was involved in that process. And our lawyer at the time was Stephen Jones, uh, was the end of the attorney, but he was a lawyer at the time. He has office in Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. but he was the ACL ACLU lawyer. Okay. So um, it's my understanding that there were four chapters of the ACLU. There was Tulsa, there was Stillwater, and then Norman and Oklahoma City. In Oklahoma City. City. So uh, did each of the chapters have their own board and their own work? How, what was the relationship with the state organization when it was formed? Yeah, How did that well, each, each, each uh, organization, local organization, had their own, their own board, their own operation, so they operated separately. Uh, the state board was, was the overall board, state board, and a state board was the one that had uh, uh, funds for an executive director. So we hired the first executive director for the ACLU. Uh, Shirley Barry was our first person we hired. Who was, was Shirley Barry, B-A-R-R-O-I. 
She was the first executive director we hired for the ACLU in Oklahoma. Sherry, S-H-E-R? Oh, uh, Shirley, Shirley. Shirley, Shirley, okay, okay, got it. Okay. If I was from New York, I'd say Shirley. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Then I also came across that OSU also established a campus unit. A uh, student. Student. It was a student. Yes. It was a student chapter. Okay. Uh, in which uh, they had their own uh, concerns in terms of civil liberties on campus. Uh, the Stillwater chapter was involved in looking at the community as a whole. And uh, even though most of us were part of the university, uh, but the student had their own chapter on campus as a student organization. Mm -hmm. and I think Richard Cummings was the advisor to the student chapter. Okay. All right. So um, you, you became involved in the Stillwater chapter, and then, so tell me a little bit about how your involvement um, at the state level, how that worked. At the state level, uh, we were primarily looking at the uh, problems within the state, the prison system, uh, First Amendment rights in terms of free speech uh, around the state in all areas. But I think the prison was one of the major areas we were involved in, in terms of uh, uh, civil rights, civil, civil liberties and civil rights for the prisoners. At that time, Oklahoma was segregated in terms of the prison system, uh, in terms of prisoners were segregated. And it was not much uh, in terms of civil liberties within the, within the system. Uh, they had uh, Boxes with they put prisons in, prisons in. So there was the lockup, the, and but the main segregation was the main the main thing that was so so difficult about the prison system. And prisons had, you know, of course, when you're locked up in prison, you don't really have you don't have any rights. But at least you have there are human rights involved in the process, and that was our main concern that they be treated humanely, and that there be some sort of due process within the system for prisoners, even though we know that uh, some were going to be there for a long time. And some people should not be out among us. We understand that. But we have to treat them humanely and legally within the law. There's still certain rights you have as a human being in terms of your rights to medical treatment, uh, rights to food and health and safety. Those are things we were looking at. And the segregation of the prisons did not allow that to happen for many of us. Bobby Battle was the uh, prisoner that that came forth to file a suit against the segregation of the prison. It's called the Bobby Battle versus uh, Oklahoma the case. Mm -hmm. And was that under your leadership term when that was going Well, on? Gloria Weber, Vince Lee was the, was the chair at the time. I was just a vice chair at mm -hmm. the state level and served on the board. That, so I was just a member of the board, yes. Mm -hmm. Were the terms for the board three-year terms? Three-year terms. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, You could be reappointed again and I think I, I think I served almost two terms. I'm, I think I served about five years on the board. Who did, who appointed? Oh, the board elected. Okay. Elected as members, yeah. Okay. They were elected by the, the board. All right. Um, and while you were on the board, was that when uh, the board was able to hire a part-time and then a full-time director? Yes, Shirley Bear was the first person hired mm -hmm. as our part-time director. And how about an office? Was there an office? Uh, we had an office in Oklahoma City, uh, established an office. Uh, mm -hmm. I can't remember exactly where it was, but we did have an office in Oklahoma City. And those were the things that we paid for. for the. Uh, and the, the national office helped us on some of this. So, uh, and as a representative, I uh, had an opportunity to go to Washington, I mean, sorry, New York, to the national office for serving on a committee, on the national committee for selection of a, of a director. So I did have that experience one time, went to New York City as a representative for the local chapter to go to New York City. What was that like? That was an experience. I stayed across from the street in Central Park at a, that's an interesting, I had interesting experience at that time. Uh, that's the first experience I had of, of, uh, of being ripped off by a cab driver. <laughs> that really wasn't a true cab driver. Oh. <laughs> we, had, we had guys uh, hustle. As we got off the, off the uh, uh, plane, we went took the, took the uh, train to the station and went to Grand Central Station and got off to get a taxi to get to the, air, to the hotel. And there were lots of uh, uh, guys lined up pushing you to get to, into a cab. So we feel it was normal. So we got to the cab, and so there was a guy driving in one little front seat. 
And uh, they took about six of us in a cab, dropped us all off, and each one dropped us off. I was the last one to get off, get out. And, uh, and when I got out, he kept talking as New Yorkers do and, and mentioned some do dollar sign. And he said something like 2250. And, uh, and I said, no, I don't think so. I'm not paying you that much. Money. That's, I said, most, this was five, this was five dollars. I was thinking five dollars walked off and left. And he started coming after me, but there was a police around the corner. So he, he left right away. So I went in the hotel and I asked about the cost to get to Grand Central Station. He said it'd be a dollar fifteen. Oh. <laughs> so, and he was going to charge me $20 uh. because I was out of town. Mm -hmm. And of course, I was dressed with my uh, Oklahoma string tie on. So I just got off the boat <laughs> with a New Yorker. <laughs> Interesting experience, yes. Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh. So back to the um, ACLU board in Oklahoma. Do you remember if you all met quarterly or six times a year? Uh, we met almost monthly for a while. Okay. Uh, it was always on a Sunday. Oh, on a Sunday. Yeah. Because I remember missing the Super Bowl game when the New York Jets won. Uh, I was a Super Bowl fan, and so we had ACLU meeting that Sunday. So I missed a full game on TV, and that was the, the most exciting game because that's when the New York Jets beat the Green Bay Packers, I think. Uh, I'm not. No, it was the, the uh, Baltimore Colts uh, because Earl Morrow was from Detroit and it was the Colts. And I was a avid Everett fan. I missed the, missed the whole game, ACLU meeting, but dedicated to the ACLU. Oh, yes. You sacrificed. Sacrificed, <laughs> yes. How long did the meetings usually last? Uh, maybe two hours at the most. Mm -hmm. But we were in Oklahoma City, so we had to drive. And sometimes we would drive to Marshall to pick up Angie DeBoe on occasion. Uh, there was a fellow who lived there in Marshall would bring up to the, to the meeting. She was on the board. But every now and then he couldn't do it, so we would drive to Marshall, pick her up, and then drop her off in the back home. Gloria Webb and I, and sometimes Richard Cummings, but Gloria Webb and I were the two that would drive over and pick her up mm -hmm. and take her to the meetings and bring her home afterwards. And so those are some precious times and spending time in the car with Angel DeBoe for, for an hour or so, two hours, uh, once a month or so. Let's circle back around to that later, later okay. in the All interview, right. okay? Yes. Okay. I do want to hear about that. Um, were there particular, you mentioned that you were vice chair. Of the yes. State it's, it's, were there other leadership positions that you held? Did you all have committee chairs? Uh, we had finance committee, uh, finance committee and legal and legal committee. So we had lawyers who were involved in the legal aspect of this. Uh, Stephen Jones was the primary attorney, and there were other attorneys involved that he would have uh, associated with and that he would get uh, input from. So there was a legal group. Mm -hmm. And of course, we had the financial group uh, committee. And that was pretty much the, the major groups and that we had financial. And uh, of course, the executive director was a uh, overall leader in terms of the program. Did most of the uh, work in terms of organization, uh, contacts, that sort of thing, the, the, the administrative part. Mm -hmm. The clerical part. Do you remember what year you joined the state group? Uh, it had to be around 1970, in 70 to 73 or somewhere in that time. Okay. And then until probably the mid 70s? Right, yes. Okay. So about 70 to 75 or so. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so. Were you still going through the tenure process when you were involved in this? Uh, yeah. Well, let me see. Yes, I was. Um, I was tenured in '72. Okay. Yeah. So you were already involved in this, going through tenure. Going through tenure and promotions. Yes, during yeah. the process. Yeah. So, did that pose any particular challenges for you? Uh, it was a It was a, It was not a challenge for me. It was a challenge for the administrators at the university. university. And I, what I mean by that is that because of my involvement, uh, I was very much involved in uh, not only that, but in terms of my teaching and research. So I had a research lab, graduate students. I was publishing papers. I was doing all the academic things that you could do. 
And if I were not, then it would have been easy. But because I was doing those things, uh, my outside activities, which was in sometimes uh, uh, not what administrators want to see or hear, uh, they would have difficulty in trying to do anything against me because of that. It would be very difficult. Uh, there'd be liability involved that they, it was not worth the effort. And, uh, and it was nothing I had done uh, to cause any problems for anybody. I was still good with my students. Uh, I met, met all my classes. I taught 7.30 classes, biochemistry 7.30 in the morning. So I had a large class of uh, uh, students in the pre-professional sciences. In the early stage, I taught the vet students. The first class they had when they entered as a freshman vet student was biochemistry 7.30 in the morning. And had the last seven, had the last Saturday morning class on campus because the vet students been on live on Saturday morning, and so I had the last Saturday morning class at the university that existed. Mm -hmm. So I published papers, I received money for grants, had graduate students, and met my classes. So I did all the things that I needed to do. So it was, and then having a family with uh, children, also making sure my kids were met responsibilities as a family. So it was, and I think about it now, and I'm wondering, did I really do all of that? <laughs> the answer is yes. I can see why. So it would have been a problem. It did have one, one situation, which I'll talk about later, that was a, was a problem that was, it turned out not to be a problem at all. Oh, good. It's just a little, what I call a hiccup. Okay. How, what was the diversity of the board at the time? that you were serving? ACLU board. ACLU board. Uh, we had members around the state. Lori Winston was Hispanic, so she was on the board. I was uh, on the board as African-American. And we had uh, members from uh, other parts of the state, uh, from Oklahoma City. I think there's a member from Tulsa. So it's pretty much around, but, but it's, it turns out Stillwater had three people on the board. <laughs> Oh, at the did. time, yeah, okay. Richard Tummins, myself, and Gloria Weber. Oh, that was the Stillwater board. No, that was the state. Oh, the state Stillwater. Board. Stillwater, Stillwater people Stillwater from Stillwater on, on, the, on, the, state on the state board. board. That's yes, remarkable. Mm -hmm. it, it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And were there uh, for the local group for the Stillwater group? Were there similar commitments as far as meetings and? Yeah, we met. We met uh, regularly. Uh, we would meet at different places in in, uh, in the city in Stillwater. Uh, we met at some churches and we met at the uh, community building in Stillwater. There was a community building on 12th Street in uh, the black community. There was a building there we met. Uh, we would meet periodically, but we met at some of the churches and other places, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Um, and thinking about the ACLU of Oklahoma, um, do you you mentioned that I believe that they that you all worked closely with the national headquarters? Yes. They helped get the state group established. Did you talk a little more about so, that? So, uh, in other words, we we're being chartered by the by the national organization. So we did have a charter from the national organization. Mm -hmm. And when we had a case that was of national interest, they, they would send down an executive director. So we had the executive director come here several times to speak to, to Oklahoma because we had uh, cases that they were in, had national interests. And so they would come down. They, I remember the uh, uh, legal counsel for the ACLU, named Melvin Wolf, W-U-L-F, mm -hmm. came to visit with us when we had our uh, uh, case against the governor of Oklahoma. Uh, Melvin Wolf did come down to visit with Steve Jones and the legal team. Okay. Were there other state affiliates that you all were working with? Uh, just the Norman, Stillwater, and Tulsa chapters, the only ones that I remember that okay. existed at the, at the time. Okay, what about other state organizations? Did, did you all partner with on anything? Well, there were, NACP was one of them, mm -hmm. uh, one of the organizations, uh, which on, the other, other organizations are interested in civil liberties, but mostly civil rights. And, uh, so, so, and, but we were civil liberties, and sometimes to make that distinction is really difficult for people to understand that uh, there's a difference between the two. And some civil rights are civil liberties issues, but all civil liberties are not civil rights issues. <laughs> uh, civil liberties is primarily uh, focusing on our basic rights according to the, the amendments of the Constitution. That's what the issue really is. 
and civil rights uh, involves other other rights that some may be part of the Constitution, some may not be. Okay, um, let's let's talk about the Stillwater people that were involved with the ACLU of Oklahoma. You mentioned Richard Cummings. Richard Cummings. He was a professor here. At professor, OVA. electrical engineering professor. Huh. He's retired now. He has a farm in uh, Ripley. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he farms. All right. Uh, what stands out to you about Dr. Cummings? Uh, he was intimately involved in, in, in making sure that, well, he was also advisor to students in engineering. Mm -hmm. And he had a lot of uh, excellent students that he advised. He was advisor to the student government, too, for a while. And I remember Richard Cummings primary was concerned about a whole issue of civil rights and civil liberties, but civil liberties was his major uh, interest in terms of uh, making sure things are done right in terms of uh, civil liberties. And he was intimately involved for many years in, in that area uh, as a faculty member. Mm -hmm. Did he help mentor you? Was he, or he was already here and established when you came? Yeah, he came about the same, about the same time oh, okay. I did, yeah. He's okay. not, just a few years older, not, not a whole lot, a few mm -hmm. years older. Um, do you remember Gail McDonald being on the board? Uh, yes, not very well, though. Yeah. Okay. He was a member of the board. Gail McDonald was a member of the board. Okay. You mentioned Stephen Jones a couple of times. He yes. He was a general counsel. Legal general counsel, counsel. counsel for the ACLU right, at that period of time. What stands out to you about him? Uh, what stands out about Steve? Uh, how bright he was. Steve was really one of the uh, more technical-oriented lawyers that when Steve went to court, judges would dust off their law books and begin to uh, follow the, the law because Steve was very well versed in the law. Uh, I think he was at University of Texas. I think he had his degree at University of Texas. He came to Oklahoma, UT Austin, as a lawyer. But he was uh, very well versed in the law, avid reader. Uh, he was a uh, reader of Lincoln. He's a Republican, very strong Republican, mm -hmm. uh, but he believed he read everything that written by Abraham Lincoln. He was a Lincoln expert. But I remember him as being a true scholar of the law. That's what impressed me most about Stephen. Mm -hmm. Do you keep in touch with him? Uh, not lately. This is the last year I've heard from him and I've kept in touch with him periodically. Mm -hmm. But not as much as I should. I, I want to. I need to contact him again and talk, give him a, a call, talk to him sometime. He's a very good friend. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good friend. Do you keep in touch with Richard Cummings? Uh, Pure I can not, not as much anymore because Richard's pretty much uh, uh, at home on his, on his farm. Mm -hmm. And I've seen him periodically and his wife periodically, but I don't get, get over there very often. We used to go over and visit him periodically, go over to the farm and visit him periodically. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis Bullock is another person that yes. his name I kept coming across. Yes. Tell me about him. I just, I just, matter of fact, I just saw Lewis a couple of weeks ago. He was here in Stillwater. Oh. Yeah. But Lewis Book was a, was a senior president of the student body that led the, the uh, lawsuit against the university uh, on the speaker's ban and uh, was able to get it overturned in the federal, federal court and became a lawyer and a very successful lawyer. He followed through with the Bobby Battle case and carried that through. But he also, uh, he must have filed suit against the state of Oklahoma on the prison system for 15 years. And his incremental changes as he continued to go back and forth. And he finally got tired and tried to say, can't we just settle this? Can't we just have some sort of agreement that we get this thing settled once and all? Because he got tired of filing lawsuits. Uh, he filed a lawsuit, they lose, he get his fees, they go back the same way and he filed another lawsuit. That went on for 15 years. He just got tired of it. And he also uh, took on the the, uh, the policeman the, for the black policeman in Tulsa. That was his other major thing he did in terms of working and continue to fight for civil civil rights and civil liberties. Mm -hmm. So very good attorney. I guess he learned well from Steve Jones and from from Richard Cummins as a as a student. That's a remarkable. Thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Then uh, you've mentioned uh, Gloria Valencia, Valencia Weber. Weber. A yes. Few times. Um, we have an oral history interview with her about Amy good, Bo. good. She can she'll give you all the details because she was the one to be involved with with uh, Andy Debose. She spent more time with it than anyone I know. Okay, 
One of the things that she said in terms of the ACLU was that, and I'm quoting here, uh, it, it had been a committee of liberal gentlemen to meet periodically to feel good about being liberal. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> she said that uh, there were efforts to, and I quote again, try to move that committee to the protection of constitutional rights. Uh, it became a very core commitment to a number of us, including Earl Mitchell and Richard Cummins. Yes. Yeah. That, that, interesting, because I think that's the best way to describe the ACLU for a number of years. Okay. It was all male what I call white males, liberal males, who were very open, but were interested in what I call navel gazing. Uh, means you lay in, the stump, lay in the bed and put celery and salt in your belly button and eat celery from your belly button, called navel gazing. <laughs> so you're just looking in. <laughs> not really committed to taking any action then. No, not, nothing that was too controversial. Only things that were safe, that the, that, yeah. that the public would really like you to take, to take on as a... Uh, issue. And there, there are a lot of issues that come on that the public would love you to take on. But anything that's controversial in terms of, uh, for those, what you call the least of these, those that have nothing, they would not really step in for those people who were not, uh, who were the, the most unprotected group, they would not do that. And uh, that's why the Bobby Battle case was, was such an interesting one, a critical one for ACLU, because it involved a prisoner who was in there for a reason, but wanted the prison to be integrated and the rights of prisoners be taken seriously, where that's not a thing that the public in Oklahoma would really like to see. We like to throw them up, lock them up, throw the key away, and not be bothered with them. And, uh, and civil rights for prisoners is something that was not very popular at all. Is Oklahoma different from other states in terms of that, do you think? Uh, probably. Not, a, not, not very different from other states. I think we're talking about a period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, nowadays, uh, prison reform is on everybody's lips. But at that time, uh, every state wanted to lock them up and throw, and throw the key away uh, because these were people. The, uh, the old saying is that we locked up those we're mad at with those that are really dangerous. So there are some we're just mad at and some uh, are really dangerous. And we don't make the decisions between the two. Um, are there any other board members that stand out to you that you served with? Uh, there was a lawyer, Eric. Oh, boy. A lawyer involved with us named Eric. I can't remember his last name. He, he took off some of the cases when Steve Jones stopped on. Name is I know his first name is Eric. I'll we'll look him up. Well, okay, we can yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So there are a couple of cases in particular that uh, I had on my list to talk to you about. Um, one of them is the Kotka and Mitchell versus Bartlett case, yeah. 1970. The Office of Interagency Coordination. Um, tell me about that. <laughs> This is a really strange case because uh, we heard about the organization. It was in the newspaper about the governor of Oklahoma, Dewey Bartlett, had formed a group that was going to protect the citizens of Oklahoma from violent people. And he had created this new agency, which was a secret agency. And, uh, and at that time, John Mitchell was the, the attorney general for the... For, and John Mitchell had, had gotten some money from the Congress to establish these we call these special groups around the country because for unrest, it was the whole idea was to look at the unrest of the country and the threat from uh, violence from these left wing groups and black groups and all the groups that were protesting because they were violent and they were going to cause trouble. It was a communist spirit conspiracy. And so they formed these groups around the country to provide uh, equipment to them for this. So Bartley uh, formed this group and uh, General was uh, made head of the group. And we decided that with the Freedom of Information Act, we need to see what the grant was. He sent a bit of the grant. So we asked for a copy for the grant and got a copy of the grant, that this, which is open to the public. And we got a copy of the proposal that was sent into the federal government for this, this, uh, this project. And we looked at it, and lo and behold, it was written with documentation from newspaper clippings, 
names of people that were considered to be dangerous. And all that was listed in the document. And in the document was the name Earl Mitchell, underlined in a newspaper article. I had, speak, I had been speaking to students. I had spoken to, the, uh, to a group about the rights of, uh, of, for black students. I was advisor to African American Student Society. And that, as far as I'm concerned, that was a persona non grata group on campus for the, uh, so that group was listed as, as one of the dangerous groups in the, in the country. And uh, my name was listed on that. Also was Kenneth Kotka, name was listed. And Kenneth Kotka was a uh, peace candidate for Congress. He served, he ran for Congress on the, I think the fifth district of Oklahoma. He was a congressional candidate, ran on the peace program. As it turns out, Kenneth Kotka had high security clearance because he had worked in the federal government. He had, he had probably higher security clearance than anybody in the state of Oklahoma, and so he was not a threat. But his name was listed, and they had the listing names of all the black legislators in there. And it, it was interesting. This is an interesting story because it turns out when we filed suit, uh, Kotka and Mitchell versus Doy Bartlett against that organization, uh, my name was in the paper. And we had TV coverage. Melvin Wolf came down from uh, from uh, New York. We had a press conference, and there I was on TV. This this little this just barely turned. I wasn't tenured yet. Didn't have tenure. And uh, here I was uh, on TV, filing suit against the governor of Oklahoma, who controls the purse strings for this university. In one in one hand, not really. State okay. regions cover everything, okay. but. Uh, so I filed suit, and my name was in a paper, so I decide maybe I should go and talk to my department head, my dean, and then the president. And I went to visit with all three of them to explain to them what was happening. Individually? Individually, mm -hmm. to explain why, I was in, why my name was there and uh, what was the interest of it. Department head was, uh, said, well, he says, you know, he said, I would, he said, I would not, something I wouldn't do, but I understand. Very understanding, and uh, he said, as long as you're publishing your papers and, and uh, meeting your classes, there's no, there's nothing else involved in this. And and, uh, and I went and talked to the dean, uh, agriculture and college of agriculture, and he listened, and he didn't. I didn't know whether he, was, you know, good or bad or what have you, but he listened very well. He thanked me for coming in and talk to him. Uh, that doesn't usually happen. And then we talked to President Kam about it. And Khan was uh, pretty sure that I was being misled by these, by these liberals, that, uh, which is rather insulting in a way because it meant that I don't have a mind of my own. But I was being misled because I'm, you know, I'm very active in the Methodist Church and, and uh, very good in terms of my involvement and uh, a true believer, of act, active, been very much involved in the church and all aspects of it. And he's a Methodist also. So he knew about my work in the church. So his concern was that I was being misled, that my name wasn't probably on the list, and they'd lied to me and told me that, that, uh, that I was being misled, and because he knew I wasn't that kind of a person. That's what he said, you're not that kind of a person, but be careful, you're being, being taken advantage of by these, by these people. And so I just took it at that and uh, left. But uh, I wasn't, there wasn't tenure, I wasn't worried about it at the time because I figured I had all the uh, uh, right things. My department head, matter of fact, I went up for tenure early. Normally you go six years. And he, my department head had a means, his idea was if you got somebody that, you, that you're gonna be good here, he makes a decision early, give him tenure early because he wants them here. Mm -hmm. so, he get, so I went up for tenure early, no problem. And he things. supported you in that. Oh yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. so I went up early in that. But that was an interesting case. But, but I uh, found out that I was on the list, and that's why I uh, decided to let him use my name for the lawsuit. I was really rather perturbed by that, the fact that I was advisor to these black students, uh, doing the things that we do as Americans, and now somebody wants to put me on the list as being a dangerous person. But it, it, got, it was interesting because after that name came out in the list, there were 5,000 people on that list. And of course, all the black legislators were on the list uh, as problem makers. So it got to the point I started getting calls from people because they wanted to know if they were on the list. And I told them, no, your name, they were disappointed. 
<laughs> there was a list to be on. They figured I should be on that list. You know, this is a very elite list. I should be part of this list. <laughs> they were disappointed that they were not on the list because they said, well, I'm not doing much if I'm not on the list. <laughs> so That's funny. that was the interesting part about it. <laughs> Okay, so let me make sure I have the uh, have the trajectory of everything right. So um, this started with an article in the newspaper yes. that triggered basically triggered, triggered the AC, you all to ACLU to look at. It. Richard Cummings was primarily leader in it, okay, and he he at. and uh, Steve Jones were the two that really got together on this. Okay, and, uh, and then that that triggered the. Uh, obtaining a copy of the federal grant. But the but, grant, the grant and that was submitted. Once you saw that, then yes, then we knew that we had to file suit, uh, mm -hmm. find somebody to, to file suit, and I think Kotka and and I were the two people easily would uh, would would file suit very quickly. So they, they, knew. they were selective about whose names they wanted on the suit. Yes, because of your knowledge, N position, and knowledge, mm -hmm. and both of us were really good candidates because both of us had uh, no background that would suggest anything other than being just a plain good American citizen. And, uh, and that was the point of having those two. You can get people uh, to file suit who own there, but some may have background information that could be problematic, even though what they're doing is perfectly illegal. But we were probably the cleanest two they could find, especially with a man who had high clearance from the federal government in terms of National Security Agency had high clearance in that area. <laughs> How long did that suit go on? Well, that suit lasted until uh, the election because uh, David Hall uh, became governor. And when David Hall became governor, he just completely dis dismantled the organization, tore it down. And the suit was still in, uh, uh, in action. Mm -hmm. So after he tore it down, we dismissed the, I had Steve Jones dismiss the suit. Okay, so was it several years? Yeah, it, it took, uh, I'm thinking David Hall was elected in, in 74, I think. When David Hall was elected governor that okay. year. Yeah. All right. Because the first thing he did was to disband that organization mm -hmm. and uh, eliminated it and, and threw out all the files, burned the files, and closed it down completely. Okay. Did you ever hear it called the Sooner Snooper Group? The the super, the super Sooner Snoop Group. Super, the what now? The, the Sooner S Super Snoop Group. Sooner Super Snoop Group. Yeah, right. That was the common name for it. <laughs> Gosh. Okay. And why was it called that? Well, because it was because what the intent was to collect information and dossiers on these people. That is, you would collect any time they spoke, you would have a, a tapping, phone tapping. And you have file cabinets because most of the money went for, for collecting information. File cabinets, a lot of file cabinets, and uh, informants to pay informants to uh, look at these people, and also get any information you can, even if it meant uh, uh, doing uh, uh, tapping their phones and all the things they were doing were totally illegal. Mm -hmm. But it was an organization that can run them up because it was under the governor's thumb. And the governor ran it completely. And the general thought that he was uh, probably some super Jagger Hoover, he thought he was probably. But the whole idea was to collect dossiers on all these people and build up a case so that in case there's a problem, they know who to go and get. Oh, goodness. That was the intent. That was in the, in the grant. Hmm. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah. All right. Was there a financial impact on you personally with this case? Not that I know of. I can't. I can't. I can't determine whether the financial impact. Maybe I didn't get the raise I should have gotten. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I, I, with my department, I was, uh, one of the nice things I had is I had a very strong uh, ratio with my colleagues in my department. Uh, so there were times when I had to uh, be away and do things. And so I, my colleagues would take over the class for me and I had to go, leave immediately. Because I was, I was with the students on some, in many cases I had to be with students. And I had colleagues that were very supportive, and so I, I had an unusual, unusual environment for me as a, as an African American faculty member in my department. Uh, not many people had that kind of support in their departments on campus. I was one of the few that had total support from my colleagues, and we were all together and support each other very well. So I had a, a good home base in that basis. 
Okay, so let's talk about the Bullock versus Com case, the speaker ban. Yes. Case. Tell me what you can about that. Well, that was early in, in, in I think, in the 70 area. And that was the speaker ban, uh, which the regents had. Uh, that, that started before I came here. I came in January 67, and 1966 was when the uh, speaker policy was put in forth uh, when Kahn became president in 1966. And that was already existed when I came here in January, where a lot of faculty members had left, sociology left, the whole department left except one faculty member. And there was quite a bit of unrest on campus about the speaker ban. And uh, Lewis Bullock, as the uh, president of the student body, decided that he would go to federal court against the university representing the student body. And uh, it took a lot of uh, guts to do that as a student, to go against the university and the Board of Regents. And, uh, and he didn't back down from it and was very strong about doing it. And they eventually won. ACLU you know, took it. They won, won the case. Um, fast forward a little bit to 1976, and there was a fire at the office. That would have been right after you probably. I was not on the board. No, I was not on the board. Okay, but there was a fire at the ACLU, ACLU office. office. Uh, it was no question. It was arson. Oh, was it? Yeah, we pretty we pretty sure, but it could not could not prove it. Mm -hmm. But we're pretty sure it was arson. It's, at least uh, Sheridan was pretty sure of it too. Mm -hmm. uh, either firebomb or some way which it happened, but we don't know for sure who it was. We think it was. Wow. Uh, the only thing it did was just destroy some papers, but it didn't do anything. No one was injured. We lost some papers, but uh, what we lost was, was recoverable easy, so not a problem. Okay, that's good. Um, I know your wife, Bernice, has been involved a lot in um, legislative activities, leadership yeah. roles and positions. Was she helping you with the ACLU activities? Uh, no, she was never involved with ACLU. Okay. Uh, just as a member, a support person, because uh, she, was, she was pretty much at that time, she was in school as a student. Okay. So she was busy uh, organizing the, the women uh, areas where she was, her interest was primarily in women and working in programs that uh, women and children. So she had her own uh, interests and she was only available for ACLU when needed to be with me, but she was not an active member. Just member and name only. Mm -hmm. We still are, Berlin Bernice Mitchell, our are. membership, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, okay, you talked a little bit about being a member, uh, member of the National ACLU. You and uh, Gloria Valencia Weber, were you both involved at the national level? Well, I was only involved as a as a representative to the board for a committee assignment. Okay. And what the National ACLU do, what they would invite uh, various boards to have representatives come to the national board meeting uh, to, be, to, to participate as a uh, guest of the national board on some projects. And so I represented the uh, Oklahoma chapter for one of the meetings. Gloria went to several meetings, but I went to one. You went to one. One, one year. So. One year, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So besides your incident with the taxi driver in New York, <laughs> what yes. else stands out to you about that? Well, I, uh, this is another experience, too, because uh, in those days, when you travel, you dress up. Uh, because, as it turns out, uh, in, in, those, in those early days of traveling, there were very, very not many black people traveling. So as a dress up person, I would go casual. Then I discovered that when I went casual, everybody asked me questions in the airport. They thought I was a worker in the airport, you know, how to get here, how to get there. So, so I decided maybe I need to change my style. So I dr would dress up. And this time I was dressed up in my Western outfit with my tie on. And so I didn't look like a worker in the airports. But I decided to go to an automat. Because I always heard about the automats in New York City. Automat, you're familiar with automat? No, I'm not. Automat is a place where you go and have breakfast and you put the money into the slot and you get out your roll, your coffee and everything. So automat where you go and get breakfast. And so I decided, I heard about the automat. So I went in to have breakfast as automat. And you put your change in, you can get a, whether you want bacon and eggs or it's already there in the 
And so you put your money in and get your breakfast and get your coffee. So I went in and a uh, guy came in with a big load of stuff on his shoulders. Now, I'm the only black person in the place. He turns to me and said, where do you want me to put this? <laughs> <laughs> so I said to myself, here I go again. They just can't get away from this stuff. And uh, now, here's the, here's the interesting thing about it. Other places, when this happened to me, they thought I was just a worker. This time, I was the only person dressed. He thought I was the owner, the manager. <laughs> That's why I came to me. <laughs> So, so the, the moral of the story is that you cannot always assume things about people unless you know what their intents are. <laughs> You're close. Uh, yeah, yeah. So this time, this time I wasn't just a worker. He thought I was the only one dressed up. So I must have been the manager if I was dressed in the <laughs> automat. <laughs> I wasn't one of the bums on the street. Oh. In other words. So what? What was an automat? Was it a, a place? It's just a. It's 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 a it's a like a restaurant except it has. Windows where you go in and you put money and you get the food. Oh. Breakfast automat. You get your breakfast in it. So it had a window and then they would slide the food out to you? It was in the case. And you just put your money in, open it up, and get your food out. Oh. Some, there's some in the back repairing and stuff, whether it's donuts and rolls or coffee and, and ba bacon and eggs and huh. all the different and breakfasts. It'll be hot. And, It'll be hot and yeah. ready to go. Okay, so was it supposed to be a time saving? Yes, that was very common in New York City to have automats. It was very common too. I've never heard now of it we, now it's just fast foods. You go fast foods now. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is the precursor to fast food restaurants. Right, yeah. The uh, automat. Yeah. Okay, so instead of full service where you have a server That's right. that would take your order take and your bring order. it to you. You go and get it and sit down eating. Put the stuff on the table and somebody come out and get the dishes if it's a dish or paper mostly dishes and someone mm -hmm. come in the back and pick the dishes up and take them back and wash and put more food out so <laughs> oh, okay i learned something new here <laughs> yeah. it went out it was going out of style i went to one of the last automats and <laughs> uh okay so your service on the aclu up on the board um went almost two full terms yes mm -hmm. um what led to your discontinued serving on the board? Uh, time. I just didn't have the time. Uh, I began to get more and more involved in, uh, in terms of research and teaching. And, uh, and also I had other uh, activities I was involved in. I became more involved with, uh, with the church and the district and the state and more involved professionally. I was uh, reading more grants for the National Science Foundation and uh, NSF. So I was doing a lot of travel and reading grants. I just didn't have time to, to put into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the main reason. It's just effort. Mm -hmm. And uh, those Sundays I needed to uh, get ready for my classes, read the papers, and, and so that time, it's the time more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And I figured I had done my, I had followed suit and got that taken care of, so I had done my duty. <laughs> okay. What changes have you seen in the ACLU over the years? Uh, I haven't, I haven't seen much of a change. Uh, what I've seen is a, uh, in my estimation, a disappointment uh, in terms of uh, focusing on, on, uh, on issues, local issues. They've been more concerned about great national issues than some of these issues that are national begin at the local level. And so there are many aspects of civil liberties of people who don't have the resources to fight it, and ACLU just is not there at all. Oh. They're there for the things that are probably going to get make more money in terms of uh, because the biggest way you make money, the fastest way to make money, is to have a large case that has national interest, and that's what people will give money nationally. Everybody's like that. Red Cross, ACLU is not any different than anybody else. Uh, they run on funds that they generate. And the best way to get funds is to have some issue that's very hot and, and local issues don't do it very much at all. Right. And so you you hard to see SEO come to Stillwater to do something uh, for a problem that's not going to have a, an image that would be in the New York Times or in the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And we did do small cases here in Oklahoma. One was a, a case which we took on for some students, black students at Stillwater High School that were arrested for, uh, quote, attacking a bus driver. And it turns out there were many kids who were, who were arrested for that that had nothing to do with it. 
and uh, ACL came in and uh, took on the case of most of those kids. The few that were, uh, there were some that were involved, but, but it turns out uh, we all look alike. So when the bus driver said, those kids already did it, uh, the police just went and took names of all the kids around and wrote the names down. And several of them had just shown up to see what happened. Mm-hmm. And uh, and they were, and, and one was, and they had names mixed up, <laughs> wrong names. So ACO took that case. What decade was that? Was that in the 70s? That was in the 70s, in the 70s, yeah. Mm-hmm. Didn't make the papers very much, but uh, brought in several lawyers. Uh, Bob Murphy Sr., who was a senator, state senator, took on the case of several kids for that case against the DA. And Steve Jones had a few others. So several lawyers came in and defended the kids. And Bob Murphy was, was a state senator from Stillwater, lawyer, mm-hmm. who took on the case of some of the kids against the DA. Mm-hmm. ACLU initiated that. If they had not taken that on, do you think it would have had a chance? It would ruin the life of some, some of the kids who had their lives ruined. Okay, we're going to circle uh, circle into the Angie DeBose oh, and the yes. ACLU of Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. Um, and you you touched on this just a little bit in your interview with with Dr. Gill. You yes. About yes. You know, a little bit about it. So I, I wanted to hear more about that. Um, so you said that sometimes you all would go pick her up to go to meetings. Yes, and uh, on occasion, uh, maybe three or four times a year we would take, pick her up and take her to the meetings. And, uh, and she would tell us a lot about her life history during that period of time. And that's when she and Gloria uh, hooked up very, very strong relationship. Uh, it was kind of mother-daughter relationship. Was it? Yeah, it really was. Mm-hmm. Uh, they took each other very kindly. And uh, we, had, uh, we had Angie DeBeau over uh, here in Stillwater for a program I had at the church during that period of time. So I got to know her. I invited her to come over to Highland Park Church for a program one evening. John Rusko was the minister, and John Rusko's father grew up in uh, Marshall, so she remembered John's father. So she came to the church, talked about uh, Prairie City to the group, and uh, and we also had a uh, reception for her when she received the Henry G. Bennett Award. I had a reception in my house for her that after that award. Uh, we had a nice reception for her at the house. But picking her up was... Uh, I guess you don't realize the history you're involved with at the time until that later, because having those precious moments with Angie DeBeau was, and I look back on it now, was some really uh, precious time to visit with her. And she was a whip, mind straight, and she was in her 80s then, uh, still active. Uh, the last year she was still writing, she was writing a book on Geronimo at the time. And so she kept us appraised of where she was. And she referred to the defense department as the war department. She still used that term. <laughs> she said, well, so you, she said, the war department has lots of maps, because that's what she was in the library. Mm-hmm. And so she knew exactly what maps to get. So she got maps from the, from the State Department. Mm-hmm. She called the war department, got maps from on Geronimo and the campaign. She knew exactly what to ask for and what to get. So with her book, she was uh, intimately involved with uh, getting information from the State Department. Uh, for the maneuvers of the, of the, of the Calvary at the time and, and Geronimo's movements. So they kept, it's interesting how government kept very accurate records of, uh, of that time. And I guess many of the uh, uh, soldiers, they wrote reports. Uh, the captains, when they went out on patrol, they wrote reports. And those reports went back to, went back to Washington. So there really is a lot of information that she was able to get during that period of time. But she also had some very... Uh, interesting quotes and sayings that were, uh, that kind of stuck with me. And one was her dislike for E.K. Gaylord, the owner of the publisher of the Daily Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. She thought that was the worst newspaper that ever published for humankind. And her words is that he had done more damage to the people of Oklahoma than all the people who ever been in McAllister because he brainwashed three generations of, of, of Oklahomans with misinformation. That was her com- a, a quote. That's a strong quote. <laughs> That's right. More damage to Oklahoma than all the people who did at because he brainwashed three generations of people with, with misinformation. And that was, that was her, her comment. What other, what other uh, quotes from her come to mind? 
all the the main one is that if you're not going to write letters for me, then don't let me have you on my list right now. Tell me right now. <laughs> I don't want to waste my time and your time. <laughs> so she's very adamant about that. Were you on her list? Yeah, to write letters. Were and... you removed from her list? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I knew better. Because <laughs> when I wrote letters, I let her had a copy. No, no shit, and I did it. The, the one that really was the most interesting, I think I told Jerry Gill about this one. I think Havapai Indians in Arizona. Uh, she was a champion of Native Americans to, to the nth degree. And uh, the tribes really re have great respect for her. Uh, unbelievable in Oklahoma, how they respect her. But uh, she watched Havapai Indians and she had this list of librarians across the country that were part of her mailing list. So any action she wanted to take, she had librarians ready to write for her across the country. And uh, this bill for the Havapai Indians to give them their, their native lands back with some precious land in Arizona, which is the native land, some of the most beautiful land in Arizona, their homelands was billing Congress to give it back to the Havapai. And it was, Gerald Ford was president. Gerald Ford, uh, it was sitting on his desk, and she knew the bill every stage it was located. And every stage she had letters written. And it was on Gerald Ford's desk, and she had the word that he was not, he was gonna pocket veto it. He was not gonna do it. He's not gonna sign it, but he's not gonna veto it either. Pocket veto means you just let it sit and it just goes into the ether. So she contacted all of her librarians, and I got a letter too, saying, please immediately call and write Gerald Ford a letter. Send a telegram any way you get to it, but send a letter immediately to Gerald Ford. Tell him he needs to pass that bill. It's important. And Gerald Ford got a barrage of letters from all over the country about that bill. He signed it right away. <laughs> he got letters from all over the country. It wasn't, you know, it didn't look like a, a small group. Mm -hmm. And he didn't know it was librarians sending it across the country and other people. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, Do you know, okay, I've come across a statement, and you may or may not have any information about this, <clears throat> excuse me, that in September 1970, she went to Washington and met with the chairman of the Indian Affairs Subcommittee of the House of Representatives. Then in March 1970, just a few months later, Senator Harris asked that her statement be included in the congressional the record. record. Okay, yeah. so the question is, some people have said that they thought she actually testified before Congress, and some people have said, no, they think she just provided a statement. I don't think she did. No, she didn't testify before Congress. Okay. Yeah, I'm pretty sure she, she a statement that she went. Now, this is all part, this is all part of the Native the American. Same, same, same issue. issue. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. Um, who else was on her mailing list? You said librarians all across the uh, mostly, mostly all librarians. I, you know, a few was in Oklahoma, me and Gloria Weber, and people that she knew personally. Mm -hmm. uh, and I suspect she had other personal friends, too. I didn't know who, all they, who they all were. But I know the librarians was the main listing of people she had across the, across the country. I wonder how she came to build that list. Well, you know, she was she was involved in the organization. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's true. Yeah. The, uh, the American Library, American Library Association. Okay. She and she may have been she may have been an officer one time at some time in her career with them, but I know she was involved with the national organization, mm -hmm. librarians. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so it's interesting that when uh, when you all would ride together, but she was she was talking about her book Geronimo. Yeah. Sharing <laughs> updates on that. Updates I guess. on that it. Must yeah. Have been fascinating. It was. It was interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She was fascinating with Geronimo. She thought he was a fascinating person, uh, let alone the, the the evil things that people put to him. But she was uh, very much sympathetic with him and his uh, his problem and why he did things. She understood very clearly why he was uh, behaved the way he did and how he was mistreated, mm -hmm. so unfairly mistreated by both the Mexicans and the United States. Mason's killed his family. Uh, that was the beginning of his uh, his misdeeds. A sad story. Yeah, very sad story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think one thing remarkable about Geronimo, her all of her research and her books 
had focused on the five tribes. Yes. So he was not. He was not part of the five, part of the five, five tribes. tribes at all. Yeah, so she really went in um, a, a new direction historically it, to... For what she, her story. interest, yes. And it was something about, something about him that intrigued her that she wanted to uh, write something on him about that. I don't know, I don't know what, where, it's, where it came from when I got started, but, mm -hmm. but she was very much sympathetic in terms of, of him as who he was. So she wanted to write something on, on him that would probably, as far as she could start, would, would be more clarity in terms of what happened. Mm -hmm. What other discussions come to your mind when you think back to spending that time with her? Well, I remember asking her to serve on the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights Advisory Committee. I was chair at the time. And I discovered that she was one of the early members when they first formed it in Oklahoma back in the, in the uh, 60s, early 60s, that she was a member of that commission, uh, federal appointed. She was part of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, she told me, uh, yeah, she knows. Well, I've, I've, see, I've, I've been on that committee, and, uh, and the reason why I can't do it now, because I'm, my eyesight is, I'm losing my eyesight, and I'm having difficulty uh, in my mobility. And she said, it's taken me a long time to figure out what the problem is. And I finally figured it out. And I said, what's the problem? She said, it's all the same age. <laughs> That's why it's all going at the same time. <laughs> she was 89 at the time. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes. Oh, uh, oh goodness. Um, what were your impressions of her contributions to discussions at the ACLU meetings? Oh, she was a, a, civil, uh, a civil libertarian. And her uh, comments was always, don't do anything to disturb the beast. Do it quietly and succinctly. <laughs> In other words, don't make any big fanfare about what you're doing, but go ahead and do it. <laughs> do you think she lived by that mantra? That was her mantra. That was mm -hmm. her mantra. She wanted us to follow that, too. Mm -hmm. She said, you don't disturb the beast. Let mm -hmm. them lay and you do what you have to do. <laughs> and they'll wake up and find it's been done. <laughs> and she's so right. Did you know Hugh O'Neill from Marshall? He was involved in the ACLU at one time, too. No, I didn't. He, he was her neighbor. In oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes. I think she called him Pat. 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 Yes, Pat. 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 Yeah, that's right. I do. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, he would, uh, uh, was very much involved with her in terms of ACLU, too, for a while. Mm -hmm. He wasn't as old as she was, but he was. Uh, he had some, some health problems, too. Some reason why we didn't. Uh, we picked her up. Because he used to bring it to the meetings. Was he on the board? Um, I'm trying. I know he came to the meeting. I, he brought it to the meetings. I think he had been. He was not very active on the board, but he was there. But he would stay for the meeting. Yeah, right. He was mm -hmm. there. He might have been a member, of the, but he didn't participate very much. Mm -hmm. But he was there. Okay. Yeah, Pat, I remember. Any other memories about Angie Cabello that you'd like to share? No, those are the, those are the things. She was just uh, just a, I think a very warm, wonderful person, uh, personality-wise, mm -hmm. but uh, very talented, and uh, had a certain decor about her, in which she was a champion of of uh, the underdogs. But she always wanted to do things right. Everything had to be done with all the T's crossed and the I's dotted in the periods and in the sentences. It had to be done correctly. And she was very much strong on that. And that was her interest in ACLU because she figured ACLU was one of the groups that would, would go for the essential things in terms of deal with the problems as they, that you can solve and solve a lot of problems later by going at the, at the source of the problem. And uh, that was the way she, she wrote her books, too, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the history of Choctaw Nation. She, she went to the essence of the problem with the nation and put it in footnotes, <laughs> rather than names in the, in the body, to put it in footnotes. You mentioned that uh, you invited her to come and speak to the church about Prairie City. Yes. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, uh, her, her demeanor was, uh, was one you got to 
picture of of people in that period of time, uh, very you know working hard, hard working, but at the same time they enjoyed life uh, in their environment, and so they had uh, difficulty, they had problems, but they were together in terms of their lifestyles. So they had uh, uh, good times, and work and good times were all interwoven together, and that they were. Uh, 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 people that were the early pioneers, and she talked about their struggling, because I think she lived in a, in a uh, dugout when she was a came as a as a child, and didn't start school until she was a teenager, started school much later in life, and going to college when she was when most people were finishing college, she was starting in college and getting a doctorate in Chicago, and and uh, which is really quite a feat at the time, but. Uh, but her, but going through her book on Paris City, it was listening to her talk about it. You, you felt you were there, as she described it. And so was there a, was it an anniversary for the church that tied in with that particular book or anything? No, it was it was it, we had a we had a uh, program at the time. John Ruskell's the minister. We call it Communiversity. It was a program we had at the church where we were bringing in different parts of the community, inviting people in for various. And she was just one of the multiple people we brought in, but the, probably the one that, probably the most famous one of all we brought in. Discussions about different, different issues. And we thought we'd, we'd bring Angie in and have her talk about any one of her books so she can talk about Paris City. Oh, okay. And, so uh, she had a choice of which book to talk about? Oh, yeah. About? Yeah. Oh, uh-huh. And okay. somehow I think she, that may be one of, that probably one of her favorite books, I would guess, because she talked about it mm-hmm. in great enthusiasm. So it's called Community Versity? We call it Community Versity. How would you spell that? C-O-M-M-U-N-I-V, part of community and university take it in. So we call it community university. You only did that for about a year or so. Oh, okay. Yeah. Was that uh, an effort to bridge the town and gown yeah. in some ways? Yeah, you know, and, and, and bring people in the community to various aspects of things that you probably couldn't get at the campus or uh, for, for local people to come, we, the university was here in, in town, and so a lot of people didn't always go to university and mm-hmm. see things. We thought we'd bring something to the local neighborhood mm-hmm. and bring Angie. And we had a lot of people come to hear her. Mm-hmm. We put the word out, and turns out people showed up to hear Angie. Was it held at the church or? On yeah, the at the church, at, at the church, church, at the church. Uh-huh. And how often did that group meet? Uh, at that time, mm-hmm. uh, we had something like. Uh, once a month or something uh, so like that. We come in once, once a month. month. A program, a program, not okay. necessarily a program. Okay. That's nice. Okay. Because uh, one of the problems was, was how to. We brought somebody in doing some uh, uh, artwork, uh, paper mache, something like that. We brought somebody in, just show you how to do this. Come in, you know. We got somebody coming in. You want to do paper mache? Come in, we'll have a program. Would tonight. it be on a weeknight? Yes, mm-hmm. it was a weeknight, usually. But like everything else, you soon get tired. You, yes. <laughs> you move on. Um, in 1974, um, she, you were, you would have still been on the board. I think she wrote a letter of resignation. Yes. To the ACLU of Oklahoma. What do you recall about that? Uh, sadness because uh, she, she just felt it was time for her to. She was disengaging from a lot of things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we all felt somewhat upset because we began to realize that Angie is, is getting old and things she can't do. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was hard, it was probably harder for us than, than her because most of us thought of Angie as being eternal. <laughs> yeah. mm-hmm. This lady's going to live forever, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but that taught me something else too. Uh, the main thing it taught me is that at some point in your life, you need to sit down and have an assessment of what you can or cannot do and make that decision when you can and not wait for somebody to make it for you. And Angie was very wise in that, in that sense. But it was, it was a sad day for most of us because we, we kind of look forward to being around Angie. Mm-hmm. We, know, we know there's a lot more there that we can get from her being around because our experiences. And just, just, a nice, just nice being around. You know, it's nice to have your have a nice grandmother like her around. 
Um, <laughs> it really was. She was grandmotherly. Grandmotherly. Mm -hmm. Motherly, grandmotherly, friendly. Just because uh, she can talk about things that our grandparents wouldn't know about. I had an interesting experience with E.K. Gaylord, too. Um, one year, it must have been 1970 or 71, I was at the Frontier Science Symposium, which was uh, a program that the, they had in Oklahoma City, where they bring all the high school kids that come to the fairground across the state, and they have several lectures, and I was on a program one year. So being a guest, I was invited to the dinner they had for all the guests at the uh, Petroleum Club for all the guests with Edward Gaylord. And I happened to sit at the table that he was at. And he was, the little man, he was 99 years old at the time. He had the hearing aid with a wire coming down. And so he walking very well. He came and sat at the table mm -hmm. and started a conversation. And first I couldn't believe it. I thought this was, I thought that was his son. Because Edward too, I thought that Edward Gaylord too. They said, no, that's the old man. He was still writing editorials in a paper, running the paper at 99 years old. Mm -hmm. And he was talking in conversation about things that happened in 1910, 1912, as if it was yesterday. Wow. Uh, very remarkable person. Because mm -hmm. I didn't accept anything he did. I, none, none of his political philosophy was mine at all. So. <laughs> He believed there should be public hangings. They made that very clear. And he thought there should be public hangings to stop this crime. <laughs> uh, do you remember that um, in Angie's resignation letter that she um, was resigning over bingo as a fundraising activity? Uh, that was that was that was an issue. She was uh, Angie was a good Methodist. She was a Methodist pastor at one time. And I think WCTU and gambling was something that she was uh, felt very strong about. What's WTCU? Uh, Women's Christian Temperance Union. Oh, okay. That was a group that, uh, they don't exist anymore, but that was a group that tore up the, went to saloons with hammers. And no alcohol, no gambling. No alcohol, no gambling, yeah. Mm -hmm. So she had very strong feelings about, about that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that was part of it, but I think the main reason that was an excuse because she was tired, right. mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was you know you know it's probably something like this will this will be another battle I have to fight and I just don't have time for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was part. I forgot about that. That was one of the issues that she talked about. Mm -hmm. It's my understanding. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, the reason that bingo even came up had to do with the need to fundraise and build membership. Yes. It was always about money. Mm -hmm. It's a way in which you get money and get people to pay money. And she thought that was the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. Now I look back on it, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, in her, I found some things in her archives here. So, oh, yeah. Yes. I went, I went through. She had a she has a few folders on the ACLU. Yeah. Oh, she kept some. She, she kind of kept. She kept them in there. Folders. Yeah. So this is an organizational structure document that may or may not look familiar to you. I don't know what year uh, that was done, but. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. This 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 structure never really went into effect. Because the idea was to have the uh, presence of each one of the chapters as part of the uh, the board. That was not the, uh, didn't operate that way. But yeah, executive director and committee, those were, see we had an executive director, but the ex executive committee was primarily the officers that worked with them. But at the time we were so small, the chair worked closely with the director and the board primarily. But uh, but these committees were there, but would never really function. The finance committee was the one that, in terms of trying to raise funds, that was the, the other issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
Yeah, Mary, I thought Mary Bain, that's right. I forgot Mary Bain was the other lawyer uh, involved with ACLU. She took over some of the, she took over some of the cases that uh, ACLU did. Mary Bain, I remember that. I'm going to put this out here. But I'm not sure how much uh, this organization became functional, but yes, I remember seeing this now. That was the idea. I don't know, it may exist like that today, I don't know, but at the time I, when I was there, it was not functioning. Was it because there weren't that many there, there weren't, board members? It, it was very small. Mm -hmm. It was a small group of dedicated people. Mm -hmm. that, that was the problem. That was the main reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think, so I think her, some of her notes you yeah. know, are handwritten on here. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there was like one of the things was would the group meet uh, four times a year or six times Qu a year? Yeah, it almost looked like this is a survey where people would. It was a it was a con it was this 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 was a concept this was a concept concept, concept. and people uh, board members were making selections perhaps yes to where they want where they want to participate and how we want to do it yes. Mm -hmm. But I think this was adopted, but I never, I don't think it ever was implemented. It has choices on there. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. and I, because I, I, I've not been involved lately, but it, I don't know what the organization is like now. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they have things online. This was another thing. Uh, so this would have been. That would have been early seventies. Okay. Early seventies. She was pretty good about dating things, but oh, she missed the date on that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this one she did have dated, and this was January 1975, and it was a talents questionnaire. Yeah, that was toward the end. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. So this this is a survey to find out where how we could use members mm -hmm. in terms of organization. Were you still on there at the time? Uh, I had just gotten off the board at the okay. time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think 75 was the time where I stopped. I'm going and insulted so, so Angie too at the time. What was the letter of resignation was around that time? Her letter of resignation, uh, 1974. Okay, that's what I thought. She kept things she after. Kept, she, she kept things after, yeah. Because at the same time that, that, that we stopped, Jordan and I stopped, Gloria and I stopped being uh, involved. They started electing, they were having elect, electing more members at the time, new, new members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember. I remember this. Let me go back and look at my files. I have some files too. Oh, okay. In her um, resignation letter to the ACLU, she wrote, and I'm going to quote here: <laughs> "My regret over resigning is tempered by the knowledge that it will be no real loss to the ACLU. <laughs> I have never been a useful member of the board, and my withdrawal will not affect it." There is some loss for me, for I've had the privilege of knowing some very fine people whom I should not have met otherwise. I shall truly miss you all. <laughs> That's an Angie the Boyism, if you ever heard one, that I'm not a very useful person. <laughs> I heard that many times from her. Did you? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Hmm. She just felt that, you know, little old me, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm just doing what I have to do and no big deal for me. You know, I'm not doing very much. But uh, I'm kind of wondering if she really, uh, if that was just her, her modus operandi or whether she really believed it. <laughs> <laughs> we won't know. We'll we won't. We'll never know. We'll never know. <laughs> but I, but I know she's she's not put herself front and center. Never. Mm -hmm. And uh, she's just another. She's a, she's, a, she's concerned. She's a fly on the wall, mm. involved in there observing. Mm -hmm. And if I'm gone, no big deal. Do you think any of that was a generational thing? Yes, very much gender? so. Generational and gender, because her whole life has been Angie by herself. And uh, I think the way, the way she was treated in the world, uh, when she finished with her PhD, she could not get a job at any university as a faculty member. And uh, even though she's hell more qualified than most of the men were. And I think that, I think that never left her. She mentioned that to me one time about when she got a degree that, that uh, she could never get a job as a faculty member at the university. Did she and, uh, say it with sadness? Uh, 
she said with, with some sadness, but, but because her career had gone, in the book she's written, she felt she'd accomplished more than she would have if she'd been a faculty member. Mm -hmm. She's probably right. Mm -hmm. We had a, a, a female faculty member uh, come to our biochemistry back in the, in the 70s. We asked her about her involvement. She was a really top down scientist at the University of Pennsylvania. And she said, the reason why I was able to publish papers and do so good is because I could never get a teaching job any place. So I had to do research. So I wrote my own grants, got funded, and became a top-notch researcher and produced lots of uh, great students who followed her work. Mm -hmm. And she always wanted to be a tenured faculty member. Spent a whole career as a research. And she was she was very famous. Nobody would ever guess. Can you share her name? Uh, Margaret, uh, University of Pennsylvania. Oh boy. Okay, well we can have that. I'll answer. look her up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. She came here to speak to one of our banquets one time, oh, and, we, okay. and that was the time we asked her, "Well, tell us about your experience as a female scientist." Oh, and how many female scientists were there here at the time? Uh, we had Margaret Essenberg in biochemistry. We had a few in uh, the arts and sciences, but not very many. Not very many in the research area. Mm -hmm. There were faculty members who were, mm -hmm. but the research, but not very many. Just strictly research. Research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And about two in the whole couple of vet med, vet med school had two. Mm -hmm. In agriculture, had one Margaret in biochemistry, Margaret Essenberg. Um, you mentioned that you and uh, your wife hosted a reception for her when she yes. received the Belmont Award. Tell me about that. It was a Bennett Award. Bennett Award, yes, yeah. I'm sorry. Well, the university had, a, had a, I think, a breakfast for the group before the graduation. And it was nothing afterwards. Uh, so she got the award on campus and, I mean, on the, at the stadium. And so after that, it was free to go. Was it part of a graduation ceremony? Oh, it's always given at the, at the oh, ceremony. Okay. The Henry G. Bennett Award, there's always someone get that award. So she was getting an award that year, and we thought, this is Angel DeBeau getting an award, and there's nothing, no ceremony for her, uh, nothing. Just get the award and thank you, goodbye. So Gloria said, we should do something. So we said, well, why don't we just uh, have Angie to the house, invite some people out, and we'll bring them to the house and just give her the proper accolade she needs to have as a special guest and how much we love her and we want wonderful what she did and just appreciate her work and she was always so grateful about that she always said she said early says you know you and Bernie are very kind to me i remember that and i said we were just doing what you know nothing special you were just among your friends mm -hmm. <laughs> so we invited a number of people to come by and uh, Coach Gloria and I were the kind of like hosting it. Mm -hmm. We invited as many people around to come in, to come and see Angie. Did you all ask her for names to include on the list? No, we didn't. Okay, yeah, just people that you knew. People we knew that knew her. And uh, there were other faculty members who were aware of her presence. Mm -hmm. And we invited some of the library staff, some of the people at the time who were at the time with Noah. Mm -hmm. That was nice. And uh, it was it was it was a rather nice gesture for her. And, uh, so she appreciated it, really did. In 1977, you would have been off the board by then, but um, the ACLU in Oklahoma created the Angie DeBoe Civil Liberties Civil Award. Award. Yes. Do you, what, can you tell me about that? I think that was that was uh, created, Gloria was gone too at the time. I mean, she was one of the recipients of the award. Gloria Weber got the award, I think one of the first ones. Mm -hmm. And that was primary I think Shirley Berry initiated that whole concept. Uh, they thought somebody in Oklahoma should have an award named after them. Mm -hmm. And Angie was on the board, and she had a long history at ACLU, and so that was why it was, and she was probably the most famous person we have had on our board, and a champion for the Native Americans. And uh, civil liberties and civil rights, she had been involved, so mm -hmm. special award, mm -hmm. yeah. One of the honorees was even Governor Henry Bellman. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, a, oh, she loved Henry Bellman. 
Oh, there was a, you know, you know, he lived close in the area. Yeah. And, uh, and he's one of my favorite people too. It's another, uh, I have a lot of story about Henry Velvet too, from my years with him. Uh, he was probably one of the more interesting governors we've had. The most open to diversity of any of the governors we've had, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, from what I've known about him. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he did some things that are really unknown in terms of uh, the things that he did uh, in terms of diversity. And one of the things involves, because uh, I talked to him about it. Uh, when I was in Whitehurst, uh, he was uh, in the office there. So I'd meet him in the morning, go up on the elevator. And we'd have conversation all the time. And so I went and talked to him about several things that he had done while he was governor. One of them was he was governor when the civil rights laws changed in Oklahoma, in, in the state, in, in the nation. And so he was going to be sure that the state of Oklahoma abided by the civil rights laws, the 64 Civil Rights Act. And so he asked uh, Major uh, William Rose, ROSE, and uh, Claire Looper to do a test for him. So he called him in his office, and William Rose was a retired uh, major from, from, from Fort Sill, who lived in Oklahoma. And he also appointed William Rose as his first director of the Human Rights Commission in Oklahoma. And he asked Claire Looper to come in because he wanted to, uh, he had gone down to Southeast Oklahoma. He had a meeting down there with all the people in Southeast Oklahoma. He said, we have a problem with being a little Dixie. Okay. So he went down and gathered all the uh, leaders and the owners of, of, uh, of restaurants and hotels. He had a meeting, the governor met with them. So when the law changed and he wanted to know if they had any problems with it because he wanted to know right now because the law changed and uh, he wanted to know if they had any problems with it because if you did then i'll know what to do let me know right now i don't want any, any i don't want any trouble at all this is the law it's changed so he, he asked him to go down and check the hotel see if they see if he can live oh. <laughs> <laughs> so claire lupa said you want me to do what go there <laughs> And I talked to her about this years later. She said, yeah, she, he did ask her to do that. And so they went down and uh, they went to several places. But he told me there's one place, don't go, because this guy said that if anybody showed up there, he's going to shoot him. Mm -hmm. He said, so he, he said, well, I took the name down. Don't go to that place. Turns out this guy went out of business pretty soon. He didn't, didn't last very long. Mm -hmm. But they went down and uh, Claire Lupa said, it was like she was... Like nothing, like everything had changed, like nothing ever existed before. It just, they, she got a room, they treated her nice, and she got, you know, got the room and everything, just like, and before that, it was segregated, you couldn't do that. Wow. And she said things were fine, so she came back and gave a report to him and said things were fine. And, uh, and another case was one which is written up in the, uh, Carl Warren wrote the book on Thurgood Marshall in the, uh, he had one story in there uh, that uh, Thurgood Marshall came to Oklahoma to defend the black guy who was uh, accused of murdering a family and burning the bodies in Little Dixie. And Thurgood Marshall came to defend him. And he said, all the people in the area, the whites told him, this guy was innocent, he was a nice guy. And they said it was something to do with the governor's office. What it was, it was, uh, during the period of time there was uh, 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 making white lightning, <laughs> uh. <laughs> bootlegging, mm -hmm. it's a bootlegging problem. And there was somebody in the governor's office involved with it, there's some, some money involved in the process. And so this family was killed and burned right to the spot. And they blamed this, this neighbor who was black. And he went down to defend the guy and he said, he got a jury, the jury was, uh, all white, and they selected a jury. The jury found him guilty, but not, what they found, they found I think guilty in the second degree. And so he got uh, something like 30 years in prison. Normally they would have lynched him. Uh -huh. And everybody said, this guy is innocent and it's a shame, but we had to, we had to convict him because all the uh, evidence against him was testimony of people that just lied on the stand. And everybody knew that. Uh, this was 1940. And when Go Bellman came in as governor, uh, he pardoned the guy, gave him a pardon, and let him out of prison. Right. 
somebody went to him and told him about the problem and get Bellman part and give a pardon. That's in Carl Warren's book. Oh. Yeah, about him and Bellman part the guy that had been convicted of this heinous crime mm. that he would have been lynched for normally. Mm. Wow. Yeah. So Bellman, I know we got off on Bellman. <laughs> <laughs> Red and Angie, but Bellman, the Bellman was a favorite person of Angie DeBo. Mm -hmm. She just liked him, and they they had a good relationship too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he actually presented her final award to her just shortly before she passed. Before she passed, yes. Mm -hmm. So he knew about he knew that he knew about Angie. They were mm -hmm. kind of like neighbors in a way. So. Mm -hmm. So looking back, in what ways did your involvement with the ACLU Oklahoma impact you? Well, it impacted me because I knew that there was uh, there were people who were concerned about the same things I was concerned in Oklahoma. Uh, I didn't believe that when I first came here because this is a very conservative state and a lot of racism in Oklahoma. And I didn't think that uh, we would uh, have that kind of group available. And so it did uh, reinforce my belief in, in, in the goodness of a number of people, maybe small, but no matter where you go, there are people around who are uh, looking uh, champions of the underdogs and are willing to stand up. And that's what I really appreciate more than anything else, that there are people who are willing to stand and be counted when it's time to be counted, uh, to do the do right thing, good thing. So, so that kind of re reinforced me in my faith and, uh, and believing in that there were opportunities to do something to make a difference. And there are people around to do that with mm -hmm. and committed to it also. Would you have stayed in Oklahoma without that? Um, it added, it helped, it helped. Uh, I probably would have stayed without it because uh, one of the reasons of staying in any place is having a good relationship with, with where you are. Uh, I was in a good department. So my environment was very good for professional development. Uh, that was excellent. The environment around may not have been good in terms of environment in terms of Oklahoma, but I was in a good, safe environment uh, where I could be professional, mm -hmm. grow, be awarded things based on my ability, mm -hmm. and not, uh, not uh, uh, given anything or free or not have anything taken away from me, but on my own accord. And that was more important than anything else. And, and, and family having a, a, a good environment too. Kids, good environment. Even though uh, there are aspects of Oklahoma that are just uh, unacceptable. But as it turns out, uh, no matter where you go in the country, there are areas. You can go to the most liberal areas in the world and, and have the same problem. So it didn't matter. Martin Luther King proved that when he uh, marched in, in Selma, then he went to Cicero, Illinois. <laughs> and uh, uh, the people who like you for one thing don't like you when, you when they have to be held accountable for their actions. How do you think your involvement with the ACLU Oklahoma impacted other people? Uh, I think it had a negative effect on some people, but they were not really important. But I think it really impacted a lot on, on a number of people with very positive impact because I was able to be involved in some things and uh, make a statement and survive very well <laughs> and, uh, and get some things done and still, uh, still, be, still maintain my integrity. So I think it didn't have a positive impact on other people to, to not be afraid to stand up. So would you go so far as to say that it um, put you in a mentorship role? In, some uh, ways? in in that way, yes, very much so. I think it helped. I always felt that part of my reason for being in Oklahoma was to be a mentor, <laughs> to um, at least do things that would uh, <laughs> make my daddy proud, <laughs> <laughs> as we always say, make my family proud. Mm -hmm. But also uh, show people that there are ways of uh, of, of accomplishing things uh, by being, uh, by having good self-integrity and not being afraid to stand up and, uh, and stay, stay firm and be intentional, more than be, in, be intentional. That's, that's my 
my really take home lesson. Mm -hmm. okay. If you had not gone into biochemistry, what might you have done? Uh, history. Well, the reason I say that because I was a major in chemistry and a minor in history in college mm -hmm. and had a choice of going to graduate school in chemistry or going to law school because I had a history professor who wanted me to go to law school, thought I should be in, in that area. Mm -hmm. and I, that's probably why I ACLU too. But also uh, history is another thing that I really, uh, uh, really enjoy quite a bit. And I'm doing some uh, local history here right now in, in, in Stillwater. So I'm working with the, uh, the family here, the history of the, of the black community in, in Stillwater. So I'm doing some work there, uh, this town called uh, uh, Progress, where most of the people, a lot of people in Stillwater came from, this little small community. And so the history is something I've done. And I was also uh, lectured in a history course for, uh, in black history, I did lectures in there for when, when the when the, the chair of the history department first created the first history on black history, he asked me to come in. It's a biochemist, come in and give lectures. Well, turns out I probably knew more about black history than most people did. There's a book in the library called History of the Negro in America, published in 1882 by William uh, Washington. And it's the first history of blacks in, in the United States. I found that book at the library in 1960, 1970. And it had not been checked out since 1931. Wow. <laughs> I kept it on my shelf in, for a long time. Finally, uh, it's, it, there's a new print, so I have a, I have a, it's, a, it's been republished. Huh. So I have my own copy of it now. Oh, wow. And it's a very remarkable uh, uh, history book uh, that uh, predates anything that uh, John Hope Franklin wrote. I was just thinking of Dr. John Hope Franklin. This was pre this predates him. Mm -hmm. Wonder yeah. if he used that as one of his sources. That was his, that was his source. His he sources. used wow. that as a source. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I discovered it in the OSU library. I hope it's still here. <laughs> probably is. They probably, it's probably have a new edition now. Uh, yeah. But yeah, but I had it checked out for about ten years. Nobody ever called for it. <laughs> in those days, faculty 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 check out books and they stay on the shelf forever. Uh, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. But it used to, that's what it used to be. You check a book out and anybody we wanted just it. Renew it. Yeah, just re automatically renewed. Yeah, just, if you ever needed it, anybody call for it, yeah, you go and you get it. it in, sure. Yeah, somebody yeah. call you, turn yeah. it in. <laughs> Is there anything you would do differently? No, not really. Mm -hmm. um, let me think now. Hindsight is always twenty twenty. You would think of the things that, but if if there's something different, something else different might have happened. Yeah, <laughs> so, that's right. <laughs> so if we say that we'd do something different. No, because something different might have happened, and mm -hmm. what happened to me has been fine. Mm -hmm. So it's been good. Uh, well, you mentioned how the ACLU has changed. What you what you feel like it's changed in terms of the issues that they get involved in? What would you tell young people today about the ACLU? Well, I, first, I think I, I think you should financially support ACLU, mm -hmm. and I think uh, that's the main thing I would tell you: give the support because uh, you're making a clear statement that you're supporting the issue that ACLU supports. So I say, yeah, financial, if it's no more than giving them small amounts of mm -hmm. money, mm -hmm. they need that. So that I would tell you. Uh, if you have issues, then I would think ACL would be first, if it's an issue that involves civil liberties, and understand the difference between civil liberties and civil rights, call ACLU or contact them or fill out the forms for them. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to. Uh, they'll tell you whether they can take it or not, but don't be afraid to do it you think so. Because I think ACLU is still very important for our culture. Uh, they still uh, look at the things that are important for our civil liberties in terms of our our amendments to the Constitution. So that's the main thing. Send them a little money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
just this spring, Oklahoma House signed off on a bill banning campus free speech zones. Have yes. you been following that? Yes, 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 yes. Tell me what your take is on all that. Well, I, I think what, what has happened in this whole process is that we have a group now that are interested in free speech in the sense that it's free speech for conservative speakers. That's the issue, that uh, their conservative speech is being shouted down, uh, which I don't agree with. I think everybody should be right to speak. But I also think the uh, having an area, the OSU has taken care of that problem, so that's not an issue with OSU. We've taken care of it. So I think the, the trend now is to try and uh, get open speech uh, with the intent that the only group that's being offended by free speech are conservative speakers now. Used to be liberal speakers, so it's the other way around. And so now the interest now is that we should have more free speech and open up for conservative speakers, conservative speakers to speak, even if they're not acceptable to have them on campus. And so with the problems that existed, the violence that has existed with the certain speakers, there needs to be some control in some way in which you can have some area where people can be free. We, we, we always need a Trafalgar Square. There should be a Trafalgar Square someplace mm -hmm. where there can be freedom of expression and such that it's an area where everybody knows you want to speak freely. And that, I remember uh, the library the, Bob, with Preacher Bob, and I don't know if they're still at Preacher Bob. I don't know if that exists anymore. Preacher Bob is in here, but there are other people that. There are others, there are others that come in there. They're radical but, and yeah. speak. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but there were some things out Preacher Bob that were just untenable in, in terms of free speech. You know, you, there's this issue, and Lou Bullock made this made this point at the at the uh, meeting we have on on, on uh, free speech here a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's not the speech of yelling fire in a crowded theater, but how do you handle a speech? from provocateurs. Uh, free speech is, in, is important, and you really can't yell fire in a crowded theater. We know what that means. But the provocateurs who encourage violence on others. And the issue is, how do you handle that in the free speech movement? How's that handled? And, uh, and that's a tough question to, to answer, but it is something you should be concerned about because we're dealing with more provocateurs than we are do with the violent rhetoric. Provocateurs of violence. When you said, just for the sake of people who who aren't at OSU or who don't know, when you said that OSU has handled that, it's not a problem here. What did you mean by that? Well, we've had we've we've had areas where you know the speech zone, the speech area, mm -hmm. uh, and so what the legislature is trying to do is is make sure that, that all campuses have that area, and. Uh, and we've tackled that problem a long time ago. So without legislation. Do you think that bill is needed in Oklahoma? No, I don't think so. Okay. No, I don't. I think it's been proposed in other states. Yeah, too. No, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it's needed. So it must be, it's a bigger movement than just in Oklahoma. It's part of, it's part of a certain movement to, uh, to, control, to control speech, mm -hmm. really to control speech. Mm -hmm. And it's to uh, primarily control speech so that and what's, what's changed is that the conservatives now see the issue of free speech. They didn't see it before. Mm -hmm. Now they see it as an issue. Mm -hmm. But they were silent, sitting on hands when other people were having a problem. They thought it was okay to, to now they want free speech. <laughs> Are there any topics related to the ACLU that I didn't ask about that you would like to address or share? <sighs> I think the, the issue of supporting the most people who have the, are the most egregious in our society uh, that we don't like, giving support to them have opportunity for free speech is something that ACO does and it causes them problems regardless because people really don't like you supporting the people they don't like whether they're KKK or whether they're on the other, other exact, or the, or the violent bomb terror, uh, giving them the right 
the freedom that they that they have. Uh, the public doesn't like that at all from anybody. That's the one part about ACLU that's very difficult for most people to accept. Is it people with or without education, or is it more no, one than the other? No, it's it's it's, it's has, I think it has to do with education at all. I think it has to do with your your personal uh, concept of of who people are and who you are. Uh, people who are just opposite you, if you don't like them, they don't have they have no rights to even live. That's basically what it is. And uh, that's why I thought one of the one of the interesting things is to have a a black lawyer defend a Klansman. That black lawyer received nothing but but hell from people from considering that Klansman. But the issue was the person's right for free speech. I'm not familiar with that. That's a long that's a that's happened a long time ago. Long time ago. Long time ago. Was it in Oklahoma or? No. No. It was okay. in the South, yeah. The ACO sent a lawyer to defend this person. And that lawyer got all sorts of help from him. Wow, you're doing this. Um, <laughs> I think it would happen today. Mm -hmm. do, do you think Stephen Jones took some flack for defending Timothy? McVeigh? Oh, he took a lot of flack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of flack. Yeah. I know of people who. All of a sudden, I have a different opinion of Steve Jones. That was the attitude people said. I thought he was a great, good guy. Um, I give him, I took my half to him from taking on the case. I think he never wrote a book about it. I need to read that book. <laughs> yeah, I, I give. I really take my half to him for taking on the case, mm -hmm. uh, because those for the system to work as we as we th think it should, uh, everybody has the right to have a fair and open trial where all the evidence is presented to and, uh, and you have a right to have a defense attorney regardless of what you've done. And, you know, Steve knew he did it. <laughs> but he has a right to defend it. In, um Well, this came out in June of 1984. A gentleman by the name of John Thompson wrote uh, an introduction to the history of civil liberties yes. in Oklahoma. Yes, I, I think I read this, yeah. And uh, he listed people in the back that he interviewed. You're one of the people. Yeah, I think I remember this, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. that he interviewed. Uh, there was actually a copy of that in uh, Angie DeVos' papers, too. Mm -hmm. Or actually, it's in this room in this collection. Yeah, okay, I remember. Um, so he, he interviewed several people uh, about the history. Um, this is very big. So put that essay together. Yeah. yeah. Are there um, people, if, if there were a project to um, learn more about the ACLU in Oklahoma, who should be interviewed uh, if that were to become something that a group would focus on later on? I don't. I don't know the people involved now. Um, mm -hmm. What about still the Stillwater Group? Because I I don't think there's a whole lot of information about the Stillwater Group. No, there isn't because uh, it was a, actually it was a very a very small group, and somehow I the names I'm thinking about uh, people are deceased now who were involved in it. Uh, see, I only know Dick Cummins and myself as the two who are still around. They were involved. Uh, okay. Yeah. I remember Major Dutro. He was one of the real strong. He's deceased now. Charles Dutro, very avid uh, ACLU supporter, Unitarian. He was a major, Major Charles Dutro. How did you spell his name? D U T R E U. D U T R A U. Yeah. yeah. His son, his daughter is Sandra Dutro Williams, who mm -hmm. does the. Uh, uh, Mushroom farm. She runs a mushroom farm here in Stillwater. Okay. That's his daughter. Okay. Right. Yeah, Major Dutro was one of the real strong supporters, vocally and uh, and financially. For Stillwater. For Stillwater. For Stillwater. And Stillwater. Statewide or just Stillwater? Uh, primarily Stillwater, but he supported the national organization too. Mm -hmm. Stillwater. And other people that either moved away 
or deceased. Yeah, did come as the only person that no left. So did the local chapter? Did it just? It just ceased. Yeah, after uh, I guess they they never elected officers after we left after the the first year. After a couple of years, they never they were and we were, we never had any successors. Let's put it that way. Oh, uh -huh. And so it just kind of died out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> interesting period. <laughs> you have to have leaders to. That's right. Yeah. Do those things. Mm -hmm. and not everybody can. So. And usually, what happens is that when you evolve, you have some personal connection to it, mm -hmm. and people come in may not have the personal connection, mm -hmm. and that's difficult to be involved. You don't have a really personal connection to it, or to the issues. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, since, since most of us were involved in some form of civil rights, uh, it was easy to be involved with ACO at the time. Mm -hmm. It's another mechanism for doing the things we like to do. How are we doing on time? It's 404. How are we doing on time for you? I'm okay. How are we doing okay? Uh, oh, here we go. Okay, so I took this from from the website of the Oklahoma group, mm -hmm. that the, these were ACLU issues. Um, these are probably, these are probably more issues today than they were when we were mm -hmm. involved. Yeah, we had we only very few issues at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, would you read that list? Yes, the Patriot Act, uh, affirmative action, religion, and the Second Amendment, of course, is underlined very heavily. Uh, capital punishment, criminal law reform, disability rights, free speech, HIV, that was not an issue when we were there. Human rights, immigration rights, juvenile justice, LGBT rights, national security, prison rights, uh, privacy and technology, racial justice, religious liberty, some of these are really interrelated. Mm -hmm. uh, reproductive freedoms, smart justice, voting rights, and women's rights. That's a, it's an interesting list because it covers, it covers about every right we have mm -hmm. <laughs> today. <laughs> Where ACLU in the past has been primarily dealing with those rights that are uh, fundamentally attached to the first, second, third, fifth, and seventh amendment. They were not doing very much on affirmative action. Uh, criminal law reform and capital punishment has always been ACLU issue. Uh, juvenile justice, human rights, immigration rights, those are, new, those are new issues. But again, they involve some of the fundamental uh, things of uh, right to assembly and, and free speech and, and in terms of uh, immigration is also Religious freedom in there also. So we have religion up here mm -hmm. as part of it. I think these are broken down to very uh, specific areas, which when I was chair at ACOU, we didn't deal with specific areas. We dealt very general in terms of uh, issues. So this is a little different. So they are, they have uh, changed quite a bit in terms of how they see their. Uh, their responsibility in terms of these very specific defined issues that in in each case is involved in some something of the personal liberty. Mm -hmm. And then this one was um, it talks about that's the Oklahoma website. Oh, the website, yeah. yeah this it talks is, about yeah. which uh, cases they're interested in yes i see all the yeah the it follows the pretty much the problems we have in our in our culture today um, the civil liberties issues in terms of race sex gender uh sexual orientation religion national origin and police reform uh, some of these are not the civil rights they're, they're, they're civil rights rather than uh, civil liberties but civil liberties are intimately involved. This is much broader than, than the period I was there. They would, 
it'll be difficult to get involved in some of these issues with, civil, with the Civil Liberties Union. We're looking for those things that were primarily focusing on the First Amendment primarily. Very little Second Amendment issues hmm. with the Civil, civil Liberties Union. And I'm curious as to what they mean when they list Second Amendment as, a, as an issue for Civil Liberties Union. I don't know what that means. Because mm -hmm. uh, uh, the right to bear arms, when the, C, when the ACLU is with NRA on this, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I would not think so. <laughs> I don't know. OK, um, I, that's pretty much all the <laughs> questions that I have and follow, needed to follow up with you about. So. Well, if there's anything else, you guys give me a call. Well, thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate you participating you. in the interview today. It's been an honor. <laughs> yeah. Hope I gave you some information because uh, uh, you, some of the things that you, if you t do take a glory of Lindsay Webber, she can give you a lot more information on Angie because she her, had a... You would probably enjoy her interview. I'll send you the link to it yeah, if you're interested in I reading would, yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks so much. I appreciate this. Okay.